How's everybody doing? There is everybody. Uh, we're going to go to the first chapter of um, uh, Life Against Death. It's called The Disease Called Man. So he sep separates this book into the, the part one's the problem. So he's going to lay out the problem. In, uh, and it's called The Disease Called Man. Let's go to the end of that chapter. And sometimes you read the end, the beginnings hidden in the end. So Freud therefore arrives at the same conclusion as Nietzsche, the disease called man, but by a scientific route, by a study of neurosis. Neurosis is an essential consequence of civilization or culture. Here again is a harsh lesson in humility, which Tender-minded critics and apostle Freud evade or suppress. We must be prepared to analyze clinically as a neurosis not only the foreign culture we dislike but also our own. <clears throat> I take this. I take this to believe that. Let's just say. What is the first impulse of the human being? What is the accident occurrence of? of the first tribe or the first family there's there's a there's a murder there's a a um, a savior a savior from the murder so somehow there's always this there's this this is called there's this big vacancy around everything and in between everything and we can call that ending or potential beginning but let's just say without stating anything yet it is an ending it death is all around it can it, this this thing could stop right now so what keeps it going is neurosis what what is that initial impulse and so norman brown in this first little thing calls the disease called man i have my copy right here i've had it for a while um so then we read the beginning. There is one word which we only under, uh, if we only understand it is the key to Freud's thought. The word is repression. What is if what if everything comes in at once? What if there is no repression? What if everything happens at once? No resistance. It would it would have to be in some weird way just it'd be translated right into death. Full ecstasy at its peak, where everything comes in, everything is somehow energized, and then it is positioned in, into a fold in which you don't want it anymore. Say you keep saying you want, I want, I want more, 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 more. And then it hits a, a certain harmonic where it just buzzes. We may call that flatline or death. So the disease called man is man it's it's the water's wet disease is this impulse of of the human being and this impulse comes out of that in between abyss of death the endings of things now there's an obsession with beginnings like i want more 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 creation more more beginning 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 just acknowledging this uh this intensity and that we have to push back from it. We push back from death and we push back from too much life. And we enter, we enter into this, this ground called civilization or repression. You know, you hear the word repression, you immediately want to put a negative connotation on it. There is no escape from this thing. This is just a... Repression is more of a substance that, that we would exist in. So the best way... So I'm going to go to the second paragraph. The best way to explore the notion of repression is to review the path which led Freud to his hypothesis, Freud's breakthrough with the discovery of meaningfulness in a set of phenomena and therefore regarded, at least in scientific circles, as meaningless. First, the mad symptoms of mentally deranged, second, dreams, and third, various phenomena gathered together under the title of psychopathology or everyday life. So we have, we have different levels. There's different levels of, of existing and it always reminds me of that that statement of Fight Club. How is it working for you? There's a pragmatic nature to all repression. 
And so behind all these levels, there is meaning. I'm trying to figure out meaning right now. So I'm a repression in a repression. And we're going through this book. But once again, this this these these lectures I, I wanted to have to do with artistic process. So I think I think it helps out a lot if we know where we're positioned. Because in in this world where we watch, you know, social media things that get more clicks, less clicks. This this one right here is definitely less click. This is less uh, click. This, this isn't famous shit that, that I'm doing right here. But what is it that that attracts the most convenient participation? I would say this this is the worst uh, thing on YouTube right now. I mean, it, it it's really difficult to connect participation in this. But if you care to, and we work really hard at this, we can actually position ourselves and accept our repression. That when there is too much pursuit, too much, um, I mean, the, the need for followers and the need to gain fame through social media is a madness. There's nothing wrong with that, it's just a level of madness. Uh, my need to do this video in a low grade, over pretentious way of this eclectic book that no one ever really read except me, um, that's madness too. Uh, you know, just just to acknowledge that there isn't anything escaping madness would be a great thing to walk away from this lecture with. There's nothing escaping madness. There's workability. Sometimes too much workability is so much convenience that hidden in that in that great system of order, that grand system of order like like what we have here in America, where we we forget all the imports and exports of third world countries how 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 the price points of food in different areas is 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 overly priced and nothing and but to position ourselves that we cannot escape madness and to acknowledge that things are working are equally as mad as things that are not working this should open up the improvisational nature of you to create what it is you ever whatever you want to create and then also be aware of, am I attaching to this thing as a brand, as an idea of myself? Do I expect a response? Am I afraid of criticism? All these statements, maybe it's possible to void them out and to actually slowly become aware of things just emerging in madness. You're creating things. Here's a symbol. I throw it out here. And then we enter into the improvisational act. If there's anything that I'm, the improvisational act is important. That is the artistic process. I'm, I'm doing some bad improv right now as I'm reading this book. Meaningfulness means expression of a purpose or an intention. Sometimes too much intention cripples art. Sometimes no intention makes it not art. It's just um, junk. It makes people interpret it as junk. But to, to be aware of just these, these po polarizing systems would help, uh, would help, I don't know, what, how you interpret things. We're, we're, so, we're so good at interpreting things. Knowledge is such a great thing because we could bypass just Knowledge just bypasses knowledge. That's all it does. Knowing ceases knowing. I know this. Therefore, I don't need to know any more of it. Or knowing creates an entrance, a false entrance into the subject in which there's multiple entrances into that subject. That's what this could be. So the crux of Freud's discovery is that neurotic symptoms as well as the dreams and errors of everyday life do have meaning and that the meaning of meaning has to be radically revised because they have meaning. That's exactly what I was just saying. See, even before I read it, I'm already leaning into this, this book, is that we need to slowly exit the things we do know, not in the Zen Buddhist sense or the Taoist sense, in the sense of observing information overload 
we need all the ideas that we thought were art, all the images and colors and shapes that have gone through the screen or as you walk down the street or go on vacation. We need to re review them, you know, just like the introduction was taste the forbidden fruit a second time. Uh, where else we go? From this point of view, a new world of psychic realities opened up. Yeah, yeah, that's that's where we got to go. A new world of psychic reality, the improvisational act. Let's let's take in the data that we thought we already understood and let's revise it. Let's uh, reinterpret it. Let's misread it. Freud can thus be defined defined psychoanalysis as nothing more than the discovery of the unconscious of mental life. So what were the three things he broke down? One was madness, like the, the person in the asylum, like schizophrenics and people that are uh, pretty much, uh, their, 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 sentence, their existence is plagued by voices and tremors. And then we have the second one, which is dreams, which we all experience that because, you know, there's something... There's something interesting about being awake and then being tired and then being so um, obsessed with what is awakening, what is what does it mean where I'm full of life and energy and what is this moment where I expend all my energy in the day that I'm slowly lethargic and now slipping into death or sleep and then I go into a dream. And then the third one was the life that we all live, this manageable madness of all of our existence. Oh, I don't hear voices or, oh, hey, I don't have tremors or um, I don't think uh, sleeping is death. But um, so uh, now I'm going to this section right here. Um, but the Freudian revolution is. Uh, the Freudian revolution is not limited to the hypothesis of an unconscious psychic life in the human being. In addition to his his conscious life, the other. Crucial hypothesis is, uh, is, this, is that some unconscious ideas in a human being are incapable of becoming conscious to him in an ordinary way. There's a, there, here's another level of this, of this thing. In the poet-priest thing, and that's, well, I'm going to constantly refer to that. We're just going to leave that as like gravity for all, this, all these tangents. Is that there is, there is a, prof, a prophetic, there is a prophet in, in your unconscious. And the poet as he communes with the unconscious, the prophecies develop. This new, this new discovery of the unconscious mental life is, is, arises. And it can be taken in as an improvisational dance. As we, as we develop the new language, each one of us has our own church waiting inside of us. Each one of us has our own cult worship, our own rituals. It's, it's waiting inside of us. And as we commune, with our prophetic nature, it will arise and, and inevitably all art, all great art ends in a church. So let's see here, where is it? From this point of view, Freud could say the whole of psychoanalytic theory is in fact built up on the perception of the resistance exerted by the patient when we try to make him conscious of his unconscious. <clears throat> the dynamic relation between the unconscious and the conscious is one of conflict. And psychoanalysis is from top to bottom a science of mental conflict. Con the, the conflict is important. That's what creates the improvisational act. Entering into the conflict, not to, not to react to the conflict, to enter into the conflict, to see the pieces, to see how, to even step, to, in, to step into the conflict and step outside the conflict is important. Majority of people just step into the conflict. And they react. The realm of the unconscious is established in the individual when he refuses to admit into, admit into his conscious life a purpose or desire which he has and in doing so establishes in himself a psychic force opposed to his own idea. There is a new psychic force awaiting in each one of us. Um, as we, as, once again, as we commune with that psychic force, we, may, we develop a new language, a new way of um, approaching reality. Let's go down to the bottom of this um, this uh, disease called man. There's a small little chapter. Um, 
it's right up here. Uh, dream censorship. Even more theoretically important are dreams. For dreams, also normal phenomena exhibit in detail not only the existence of the unconscious, but also the dynamics of its repression. The dream censorship. <clears throat> how do we explore, how do we retaste the, the forbidden fruit a second time around as poets approaching priestcraft? But since the same dynamics of repression is explained, uh, expression explain neurotic symptoms, and since the dreams of neurotics, which are a clue to the meaning of their symptoms, differ in either instruction or in content from the dreams of normal people, the, conscious, the conclusion is that a dream is itself a neurotic symptom. So once again, I mean, this is just exhausting, exhausting writing here. I'm going to keep skipping it. But it, yeah, it's it's knowing that we are existing within madness. And we're creating art out of that existence of that madness. Um, there's another good part, or perhaps right here, or perhaps we are closer to the Freudian point of view if we give a more paradoxical formulation. The difference between neurotic and healthy is only that the healthy have a socially useful form of neurosis. I mean, I could repeat that again. Um, the difference between neurotic and healthy is only that the healthy have a social usual form of neurosis. Socially usual. It's a workable form. It, it has an order to it. But as the, as the artistic uh, process, we want to step into the order and then step out of the order. Being aware of how nothing is, is more appropriate or less appropriate, but that things have a, it's like a, it's like a sticky attachment in which the whole world falls into, we're, we're, we're living in a certain artistic mind frame. It's somehow we, the artist doesn't have a name. We could call it Christianity or monotheism. For, for a good se a section of it. And then we, within that realm, or we call it the alphabet. We call it grammar. Uh, pronouns of, uh, you know, how we possess and dispossess certain verbs and objects that we put, you know, work, uh, put action against. But, but as an artist, knowing that we are in uh, somebody else's artistic mind and that the key is to let our artistic mind arise into a new language, into a new expression. To be completely aware of all these things that make groups go together are not your artistic mind. Uh, when I hear the these groups use these words, it's it's just proof that they've been abducted. And that it's within, I'd like to say within these type of uh, psychoanalytic understandings is to constantly step in Knowing you're always in and step out and see how exactly, wow, look at this, look at this um, way I interpret things. Look at this way I tend to um, reflect on reality. And so what is neurotic and healthy? Well, it, the healthy is the thing that I guess it works, but it's not art. It's not the invention. It's not the advention either. It's all art, but it's, it. When it, when it comes into workability, it kind of just dulls out. It becomes norm. It becomes, oh, yeah, that's good pizza. Pizza, you know, has to go in a wood fire oven. It's better than the stuff at Domino's. You know, we set up a value scale of things. At, so let's keep going. I'm going to go over here. At any rate, to quote a more technical and cautious formulation of the same theorem, Freud says that from the study of dreams, we learn... From the study of dreams, we learn that the neuroses make us make use of a mechanism already in existence as a normal part of our psychic structure, not of one that is newly created by some morbid disturbance or another. We, when we, when I, the way I want to interpret dreams is, hey, you know, you, we want a lucid dream, you know, right? I'm ready to go to sleep, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my dreams to help me become a better artist. I, I think that's a I think that's a simplistic way of perceiving what dream is. We may just call dream everything that is not us in communication with an actual other person. We may consider dream every time we are sitting by ourselves in a chair, just waiting there, 
not premeditating meditation or premeditating um, about I'm about to go to sleep, but uh, this the solitary moment of 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 just sitting. There's dream. What's happening? What are you stepping into? And then what are you going to step out to out of to now perceive what you just stepped into? So I'm going to keep going through this book over here. I got stuff underlined. I'm going to get a longer course so I can have a better um, camera angle. Let's go to... Um, let's see, the top of page 8 over here. We'll go right here. Okay. Right here at the Western tradition. The Western tradition that the goal of mankind is to become as contemplative as possible. Freudian psychology eliminates the category of pure contemplation as non-existent. Only a wish, says Freud, can possibly set our psychic apparatus in motion. I mean, if if I was going to tell you anything about this book... It's kind of how these Christians wait for the second coming. In this sense, we are tasting the forbidden fruit a second time. And then we aren't going to be anxious about it, nor are we going to be uh, lazy about it. But that there is a wish. There is a prophecy inside you. That through stepping in to the world and then stepping out of the world perceiving um, this wish will rise and then the artistic process can now take its, uh, its momentum. With this notion of desire as the essence of man has joined a definition of desire as energy directed towards the uh, procurement of procurement of pleasure and avoidance of pain. Hence Freud can say our entire psychical activity is bent upon procuring pleasure and avoiding pain is automatically regulated by the pleasure principle. Well, this is another fascinating thing. We have no idea how how pleasure when it when it ceases when it when it right, reaches its intense intensity where you say more 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 is 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 increasing an intensity in which pain and pleasure aren't either or. It's just intensity approaching well the ceasing of that explosion. So. Pleasure and pain is just a dichotomy, but really what we're talking about is levels of intensity. So levels of intensity of too much life is the same levels of approaching death. We may call this ejaculation, ecstasy, oh, you know, we, 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 have, we also, you know, ejaculation, what do they call it? Uh, there's all sorts of French names for it. Or it is simply the pleasure principle which draws up draws up the program of life's purpose. It's very interesting pleasure. I mean, that's another thing. Step in. We're always stepping into pleasure. It's how we perceive things. Look at I like this. I feel uh, this is good food. It tastes good. Oh yeah, I'm. I can see myself um, being acknowledged. Or I I like this movie. Uh, the characters I can relate to. Or, or I'm just like swiping. I ask my daughters, are are you enjoying anything you're seeing on there? And a lot of times they're it's totally mediocre. It's like, not really, I just keep just keep swiping. At this level of analysis, the pleasure principle applies no uh complicated hedonistic theory nor any particular theory as the source of pleasure. It isn't it is an assumption taken from common sense and means much the same as Aristotle's dictum that all men seek happiness. Freud says that the goal of the pleasure principle is happiness. Once again, these are just statements. As as the poet priest, we we can't take anything at face value. It's what is happiness? Is that even what I want? Actually, what I want is new creation. As an artist, I I refute pleasure and pain, and I and I um I require I require the new. So let's just go back and we'll read that last we'll read that last uh, section again that I read at the beginning and we can see exactly how that how that um sounds different now. So Freud therefore arrives at the same conclusion as Nietzsche. 
the disease called man, but by a scientific route, by a study of neurosis. Neurosis is an essential consequence of civilization or culture. Here again is a harsh lesson in humility, which tender-minded critics and apostles of Freud evade or suppress. We must be prepared to analyze clinically as a neurosis not only the foreign cultures we dislike, but also our own. I mean, that's, that's super progressive liberal stuff right there. But one has to remember, Norman O'Brown, this is the thing you have to realize, Norman O'Brown refuted uh, the, the hippie culture, the beatnik culture. He, he hated their, their superficial unity. It, it was just, it was just drug induced catharsis. It, 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 it had no discipline whatsoever. So Norman O'Brown was caught, he, a super progressive guy, but he hated both sides. He hated these conservatives. He disliked them. He didn't like the, the hippies. But the hippies, when, we, when we're done with this book, they did love Love's Body. That was, that was a great book, and they were going to turn it into a cult. And Norman O'Brown ran from it. He purposely put out stuff like he criticized their, their uh, promiscuity and their childish retrograde behavior. And therefore, it set him free because those hippies were coming because they wanted a messiah. And anything Norman O'Brown is writing here is a pure Emersonian, Emersonian individuality. Norman O'Brown is in the line of, of uh, Emerson, Whitman, uh, Wallace Stevens. You know, it, it, this is a great man here. And so uh, this is just the first uh, chapter of part one called The Disease Called Man. And if there's anything to conclude with, we... There's no cure. There's just the improvisational act, the art process. All right. Thank you, guys.